Hi, everyone. Welcome to the channel. My name is Nick Cosgrove, and I am back for our fifth weekly Q&A. My apologies that this Q&A is coming out a little bit later on in the week than usual. Uh, we've been exceptionally busy at the gym since the restrictions eased off here in BC. Uh, myself and a few of the trainers have been working 12, 14 hour days easily on the floor every day, Monday through Sundays. So it's been a really hectic time. And of course, we love being busy. It's great, especially when we were closed for three weeks. But unfortunately, that's taken some time away from the YouTube channel. And I had quite a few questions pile up since my, my last uh, Q&A. So I promise to answer every single question that I've received, every single DM in my inbox. I'm going to answer them today. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a two-part series again. So I'm going to post this video up on the channel coming up uh, this coming Friday, and then I'll post a next one up early on next week, uh, starting in February. Okay. So let's get to it. Let's get to our first question of the day. Does the metabolism really slow down as we get older? Recent studies suggest it does not. I'm now confused as I always thought that as we get older, our metabolisms start to slow down. I'm familiar with the studies that you're referring to. Um, I've been saying this for the past 20 plus years. I, I don't believe the metabolism slows down as we get older. I've never believed that. Um, I think what happens though, as we get older, we have more responsibilities. People tend to work longer hours. They have families, they have kids to raise. Uh, life becomes more hectic. So it's easier to miss a workout, right? It's easier to cheat on your diet. I mean, if you're working a, an eight, 10 hour day and you come home, the last thing you want to do is cook up a meal. And then if you have kids, you have to be careful as to how you cook for the kids. Uh, you know, kids are picky and then you have to cook for your husband or cook for your wife. And so I think that's what happens. I think, you know, people start to make poor choices and, you know, things like uh, skip the dishes and Uber Eats that, that makes eating very convenient, but unfortunately it makes poor choices even more easier to make, right? Poor food, food choices to make. So I think that's what's happened with time is as people get older, we become a little bit more lazy and relaxed with our diet and our training. So I don't think the metabolism slows down. Um, I do think that as we get older, it's it, 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 obviously, you know, as we get older, we do lose muscle. We know that as the body gets older, we lose muscle mass. But as far as metabolism slowing down, unless you have a hormonal imbalance or a thyroid issue, I don't see why age would be a factor at all. Uh, Right now, you know, I look at me, for example, and I, I compare myself to when I was in my, I'm in my late thirties now. And I look at myself when I was in my twenties and I actually feel more fit and more healthy now than I did back then. So I actually think I, my, my metabolism is going faster now than it was when I was younger. And I think that's also because I have more muscle mass now. So I think it's important to train consistently. So you keep that muscle mass because we all know the more muscle you have, the faster your metabolisms are. Right. So, no, I, I don't think the metabolism slows down as we get older. I've yet to see any studies, that, concrete studies that prove that it does. Someone can send me that and show me. Um, I might change my opinion. But for now, I will say the same thing I've been saying for the past 20 years. The metabolism does not slow down as you get older. Next question. How do your clients with young kids find time to work out? I can barely manage a one hour workout in, a, in the gym each week. I have to be very careful how I answer this question because I, I don't have kids, right? But I do have a lot of clients that have kids. And I think as, I think as a parent, you have to be, you have to set a good example for your kids, right? So, you, you know, before you become a parent, you have to make sure also to you're financially fit to have kids. So why not make sure that you're physically fit to have kids as well? And what I mean by that is set time apart in your schedule to make time for the gym. And whether that means hiring a sitter for a few hours a week or trading time slots with your spouse, it can be done. I have clients that do. I have clients that work with us four or five times a week that got two kids under five, six years old. I mean, so it can be done. I think using your kids as an excuse not to work out is just lazy. I really do. And I know I have to be careful answering this question because I don't have kids. So it's easy for me to say I have the luxury of training whenever I want. But if I were to have kids, I would make sure that I still scheduled my workout in at some point of the day. My priorities wouldn't necessarily change. I'd, I'd want to set a good example for my kids and show them that, yes, you can balance your fitness and your career at the same time. Um, so I think it's important. And whether that means you know, maybe you have to work a few extra hours to afford a sitter a week um, or just talk it, talk it out with your partner and say, OK, I'm going to I'm going to take mornings. You're going to take nights. But we each have to spend you know, at least one hour in the gym working out. It can be done. I see it done all the time. So when people say, well, I have kids, I'm like, to me, that's not an excuse. It really isn't. And I think someone who has kids who works out would be better answering this question than me. 
But again, I can just look at my own clients as an example. And so many of them have kids and they make it work. Uh, I have a client who's a CEO and she, she has three kids all under the age of seven years old and she sees me five days a week. So, I mean, if she can do it, you can do it. Um, and yeah, you, you might have to be a little bit more flexible with your schedule. You might not be able to train at ideal training time slots. I mean, she trains with me at five in the morning. That's not ideal, right? But she gets it done and she's working 12 hour workdays. So it can be done. Um, find time in your day. You know, if you can hire a sitter or talk it out with your partner, but using kids as an example, not to work out, it's not a good excuse. And it's not a good, you're not saying a good example for your kids. Next question. Question number three, my right arm is significantly larger than my left arm. Any tips on how to bring up my left arm to match my right arm in size? And this is actually very common. I, I see this all the time, especially with people who've been lifting weights for a long time and then they come to work with me. And they have all these muscular imbalances. And sometimes it's their arms, sometimes it's their pecs, sometimes it's their legs. And I, I usually can see that because I look at physiques all day long and I, well, okay, this arm's bigger than the other. Or, you know, I can see that one quadricep is more um, defined than the other one or calf muscle is more defined than the other calf muscle. So it is pretty common. And so what I usually recommend for clients like that is to do a lot of what we call isolateral work. Isolateral work would be working one side of the body at a time, but still working them evenly. So for example, let's say my right shoulder is larger than my left shoulder. Well, I might do some uh, cable lateral raises on one side. I'll do 12, 15 reps to the right, and then I'll do 12, 15 reps to the left. Just because my right arm is bigger than my left arm doesn't mean that I'm gonna ignore my right arm. I don't wanna create more muscular imbalance, right? So that doesn't make any sense. So I'm going to still train them evenly, but I'm going to train them separately because what happens is if I'm doing, let's say that same exercise in a dumbbell lateral is where I'm doing them both together at the same time, as I start to fatigue, I'm most likely going to use my right arm more than my left arm just out of momentum. Same thing can be said for if you're doing, let's say a squat, let's say your, your right quad is bigger than your left quad. If all you do is squat, you're never going to correct the issue because as you start to fatigue at the end of your set, you're going to push more of your right than your left. So in a case like that, I'd recommend doing something like walking lunges or bench step up, side shuffles, depression lunges, elevation lunges, something that isolates each side of the body separately. As far as your arms are concerned, what I would do is I would actually do some cable, uh, unilateral cable curls. So I would do 12, 15 reps again on my right side, 12, 15 reps on the left side. I know a lot of people think, well, if your left side is smaller than your right, maybe you should lift more weight. Don't do that. You're just gonna create further muscular imbalance lift the same weight, let the left side catch up to the right. I promise you it will, but you have to throw in that unilateral work, okay? And that will solve the problem. Next question. Question four, what's your opinion on cool sculpting? Does it actually work long-term? I've been asked this question quite a few times, not just about cool sculpting, but about all these plastic surgeons, surgeries and liposuction and cool sculpting. There's another one, I can't remember the name that will come to me but there's a few and I'm gonna be honest, I don't know much about them. I really don't. I'm old school. I believe if you wanna lose fat and build muscle, go back to the basics, diet hard or diet smart and train hard. That's what I believe in. Because even if you're able to change your aesthetics through all this, these, these cool sculpting and these plastic surgery, liposuction, even if you're able to change your aesthetics, you're not changing your health. So if you're someone who's overweight to begin with, that's not good. That's not healthy. And just because you're getting the fat stripped from your body, that doesn't make you more healthy, right? Your internal, your internal organs, your heart, that, that doesn't fix anything. But by you going to the gym, doing your cardio, lifting your weights regularly, eating a clean diet, that's going to improve internally. And to me, that's more important than externally. So I, does it work? Maybe. I, I've had a few clients do cool sculpting. Did I notice a difference on them? No. Um, I'm sure there are people, there's probably millions of people out there who have done cool sculpting that swear by it. And I'm sure there's millions of people out there who've done it who say it did nothing for them. Um, but regardless, if you're doing cool sculpting or liposuction or the other one that I can't remember the name of right now, uh, regardless, that's not changing anything internally. So I come from that old school train of thought is that if you want to lose fat and build muscle, work your ass off. Enough of this, these, these fats. I, I'm tired of them. When people ask me now, I just say, you know what? I don't know. And I'm not even going to bother to research because I don't care. So I'm the wrong person to ask because I, I personally would just say, get your ass in the gym, diet smart, train hard, get results. Next question. Question number five. 
I already had COVID a few months ago and missed two weeks of workouts because of it. I'm now contemplating not getting the booster shot. Do you think I should still get the booster even if I've already had the virus? Uh, okay, so I'll answer this on a personal level. Um, yes, I think you should still get the booster shot. And this is a tricky one because I have a lot of clients who are kind of contemplating the same right now, the same question is, I have had COVID or I've had two shots. Do I really need to get the booster shot? For me, myself personally, I, I haven't had COVID yet that I know of. I may have had it maybe earlier on, but I never noticed it. I'm still going to get the booster shot. And it's again, it's not necessarily to protect me. I'm not worried if I get COVID. I'm young, I'm healthy, I'm fit. It's more about whether I pass it to one of my, you know, my older clients or my parents. So yeah, I, I do think people should get the booster shot. Um, of course, that's a personal choice. They haven't mandated that. They haven't said that it's, a, you know, you have to get the booster shot. But I personally would. Even if I had COVID, I still would get the booster shot. It's, at this point, it's not necessarily about protecting yourself. It's about protecting those around you who are either immunocompromised or elderly. So I believe they've said now to wait 30 days after you've contracted COVID before you get the booster shot. I Don't quote me on that, but I think that's right. But yeah, I definitely would get the booster shot. I plan on getting the booster shot. As soon as I'm able, I, I'm going to get the booster shot. Um, no, whether you get it, that's up, that's up to you to decide. But I don't want to put my parents at risk. I don't want to put my elderly clients at risk. I have a few people who I work with who are immunocompromised. I don't want to put them at risk. Uh, you got to make that choice. But as far as the booster shot's concerned, right now I, I'm listening to the science. And yeah, I'll definitely get the booster shot. Uh, next question. Hi, Nick. How often do you give your clients cheat meals on your diet plans? My previous coach didn't believe in them, so I never had any for my entire 16-week prep. So whether I'm working with a competitor or I'm working just with someone who wants to lose weight, build muscle, doesn't want to compete at all, most people I work with, I usually give them anywhere from one to three cheat meals a week. Um, and that really depends on the individual. And it doesn't just depend on how they're looking or the results that they achieve. It's more about the psychological component too of a cheat meal. I mean, some people I work with, they don't like cheat meals. A cheat meal is a trigger for them. If I give them one cheat meal, it turns into four cheat meals within one day. So what I typically do with most of my clients that I work with, I'll start them off. I'll, when I start, first start working with someone, I'll ask them a bunch of questions in their questionnaire and I'll get an idea of whether or not they're an emotional eater. If they're an emotional eater, I'll usually just give them one cheat meal a week. Um, if there's someone who can kind of take it or leave it, like myself, I'm not a big, I'm not a big foodie. Uh, I'll give them two or three. And you know, if someone's very lean, I might give them four. The, again, this is a very personal question because it depends on the person that I'm working with, whether the person has a fast metabolism or a slow metabolism, whether they're getting ready for a bodybuilding or bikini show, or whether they just want to lose average of two, three pounds a week. So there's a lot of factors to take into consideration when you're doing a nutritional plan for somebody. You can't just answer that question and give a generic plan out to everybody. It doesn't work like that. But uh, I have a lot of people I work with who I don't even give them cheat meals. And I'm not saying that cheat meals are bad. I'm just saying for those people, they're triggers. And then I have other people who they love to have their cheat meal because it actually keeps them on track. Re but regardless if I'm giving someone one cheat meal or three cheat meals, what I always tell people to do is have that cheat meal as the last meal of the day. And the reason I tell them that is because if it's your last meal of the day, when the meal is done, most likely you're just going to go to bed. Problem is if you have that, let's say you go out for brunch and you have waffles or pancakes and eggs benedict, what's going to happen is a few hours later, you're going to be craving more sugar, more uh, greasy foods. So you're going, to, you're going to most likely cheat on your diet again. So that one cheat meal becomes an extended larger cheat meal. So you have that last cheat meal, let's say seven, eight o'clock at night, you go out for dinner with your girlfriend, your wife, your husband, whoever, that's it. The meal is done. You go to bed, no more cravings. Um, so I'm not going to say that your coach is wrong because I don't know this person, uh, the person who sent me the question, I've never worked with this person. So I, I'd have to actually talk to you and go through the questionnaire and figure out if you are an emotional eater, what foods are your trigger points. But I believe it's okay to be a little bit more flexible in your diet. But again, I, I, I would recommend cheat meals and not cheat days. That's very important too, because I know a lot of coaches out there prescribe cheat days to their clients. I'll never do that. I don't believe in cheat days. Cheat meal, one meal, it's done. Um, you know, if you're, if you're someone who can get away with two or three cheat meals, we'll do it. But again, that's an individual based question. So it's really hard to say, 
specifically for this, for this person, but what you can do is you can always DM me and I'll answer your question and you will send out a questionnaire to you and we can go, that, go, go through that together, okay? But yeah, I wouldn't recommend going crazy on your cheat meals. And I would always recommend having your cheat meal at the end of the day. Next question. Uh, I get really bad pain in my left elbow whenever I do dumbbell presses. The pain is so bad sometimes that I can't even press light weights. I'm worried it's arthritis, but I'm only 29 years old. Any idea what I should do? Hey, well, first of all, arthritis does not discriminate against age. I, I, I have clients who are in their early 20s who have arthritis. I have two clients actually in their early 20s who have arthritis, both uh, hockey players. So from, 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 one of, from this information that I have right now, I, I doesn't sound to me like it is arthritis. It sounds to me because it's in your elbow and because you only feel it when you're doing uh, pressing movements, it sounds to me like it could be either tennis elbow or golfer's elbow. Um, regardless of which one it is, what I'd recommend to do, uh, try getting a massage ball and putting that massage ball either against the, the wall or against the floor and putting your tricep into that massage ball, like massaging your tricep, the back of your arm into that ball. What that might do will actually alleviate some pressure in your elbow. Now, if you're noticing pain going down your arm when you're doing it, it most likely is going to be a golfer's elbow. Okay. And that's pretty, it's, I'm not going to say it's easy to get rid of, but it's manageable and you actually can get rid of it. So what I would do is before you do any pressing movements, whether it's a dumbbell chest press or dumbbell shoulder press, just as part of your warm up, get a massage ball. You can get them, I believe they're like $10 on Amazon. It's like a lacrosse ball. We want a hard ball. You don't want to use a tennis ball. You want to use a hard ball and just massage, massage the shit out of your tricep and see if that, that helps. Um, move your elbow around too before you do any presses. So one of the things I do, I do a lot of dynamic stretching before I warm up. And dynamic stretching is usually just moving around. So I'll do this actually as part of my warm up before I work out. That helps too because that will help release synovial fluid into your joints. It doesn't sound to me like it is arthritis. Arthritis is with arthritis, you usually feel it more chronically throughout the day as well. So you feel it regardless if you're in the gym or not. If you're only feeling it when you're doing movements like pressing, it most likely is going to be either tennis or golfer's elbow, um, one or the other. But I would still recommend getting on the massage ball, trying that, really dig it in, move your elbow around, grease up the joint a little bit, um, and see if that works. And if it doesn't, the next thing I'd recommend is go see an RMT and see if the RMT can help you out with that. Um, but that's what I would do first. I, I really don't, it doesn't sound to me like it's arthritis. Okay, next question. Um, I've been working with my trainer virtually since the pandemic began. I want to go back to the gym now that he used to train me at and train with him, but he told me he's only training clients virtually now. He says I can just, I can get just as good of the workout at home with my four sets of dumbbells than I can at the gym. Is he right? Okay. So basically the question is asking me, can you get the same type of workout at home with your trainer than you can in the gym? And I'm going to be completely honest. Absolutely not. Okay. Uh, I said this to many of our clients at the beginning of this pandemic. Um, when I was, when I, we had Megan work doing all the virtual training sessions for us. And I, I would tell clients, I'm like, it's not going to be the same thing. You're, you're not going to get as good of a workout, but it's better than nothing. But now that gyms are open, if you were to ask me, Hey, can I get just as good of a workout at home than I can at the gym? No, I would be lying to you. I'd say, Oh yeah, sure. You can get just as good of a workout doing a home workout than you can at gym. Absolutely not. That's bullshit. And anyone that says that you can, no. Is it better than nothing? Sure. But if you have the choice of going to the gym or training at home, there's no comparison. The gym, I'm assuming if you're at home, you don't have access to a squat rack unless you live in a house and you have a garage or basement. Probably not. If you live in a condo like me, no, you like this person has four sets of dumbbells. Uh, you have so much more available at a good gym. Like at our gym, we have cable machines. We have multi-cable machines. We have dumbbells that go up to 100 pounds. We have squat racks. Uh, we have barbells. We have kettlebells. Uh, yeah, you can't even compare the two. So I, I think, and not, not to badmouth your trainer, I mean, I, I know a few trainers actually that have done this now during the pandemic. And what they've done is they've, they've taken all their clients virtually. And that's great for them because they don't have an overhead anymore. They don't have to pay rent to a gym. So they're, they're probably charging the same rates that they were charging before. And now they don't have to pay rent to a gym. And I'm not saying your trainer's doing this, but to me, I, I, I couldn't justify to my clients to say, well, you know, I'm not going to train at my gym anymore. I'm going to train you out of my condo. I don't have to pay my rent anymore to my landlord. 
I'm going to charge you the same. But yeah, you can get the same workout. No, that's total bullshit. Part of the experience of working out is going to a gym. Uh, again, is it better than nothing? Yes. But will you get the same type of value from a home workout versus training the gym? Absolutely not. It's not even comparable. So if you want to go back to the gym, I would go back to the gym. I would tell your trainer, no, I want to go back to the gym. And if he doesn't want to train you at the gym, find another trainer. Because you're not going to get the same benefits working out at home than you will in a gym. I promise you. Not going to happen. Next question. Uh, I want to make the back of my arms harder. They are soft and flabby. I have access to a gym in my building that has a cable machine and dumbbells. How often should I train them in order to see improvement? Okay, so this is actually a, a woman that's uh, messaging me and asking me this. So it was a person on my Instagram. So I'm, I'm assuming she's talking about her triceps. And that's actually a common question I get from a lot of women, because as women get older, especially if they don't work out with weights, they tend to get what we call that bingo arm back there, that flab back there, right? Guys, we get it in our love handles, but women tend to get it in the back of their arms. And the reason for that is actually that's where women carry a lot of their estrogen. So that's the reason why that area can get very soft if you're not training with weights. Now, this comes back to not necessarily training the muscle more to make it harder and more defined and lose body fat. That's not going to do anything, but training it intensely and efficiently, that's going to, what's, that's, what's going to create the muscle. So it's not necessarily how often or how long you train the muscle for. You could train that muscle for 20 minutes a week and train it balls to wall, go all out and like burn the shit out of that muscle. That would be more than enough as opposed to training it, you know, half assly for an hour, three, four times a week in the gym and just doing light weights and you're not really feeling the muscle contract. So in this situation, what I would do is I would balance out that muscle too. I would work your tricep. I wouldn't, I wouldn't neglect the bicep. I would train your tricep with your bicep. And when it comes to your arms, I'd have to assess your physique, but I wouldn't recommend working the triceps more than twice a week. Most people I work with just work their arms once a week, myself included. That's more than enough. Because you have to remember, if you're doing um, a proper workout split where you're doing a lot of chest presses, shoulder presses, you're going to get a lot of tricep work indirectly, right? So I would recommend training the overall the body and have a good five, six day training split and you'll get better results as opposed to just going in the gym and training your triceps three or four times a week for an hour a day. That's not, to me, that's just going to overtrain the muscle belly and it's not going to help at all. In fact, it's probably going to have um, adverse side effects. So it's not going to do anything for you. You'd probably actually lose muscle doing that. So I wouldn't recommend doing that at all. And you risk injury too, overtraining the muscle. So if you want to bring up your triceps or any muscle group for that matter, don't necessarily train them more, just train them as hard as you possibly can in and out of the gym, move on to your next muscle group the next day. Okay, next question. I get cramps in my legs whenever I train them. I also get cramps in my legs when I do ab exercises such as leg raises and bicycle crunches. Is there anything I can do to stop the cramping? That's actually very common. I have a, quite a few clients that get cramps in their legs when they train both men and women, um, especially when we do abdominal work and they're doing things like leg raises, reverse crunches or bicycles, like this person says. Um, and what I usually chalk it down to are two things. It, it can either be a dehydration issue, okay? Or it could be a sodium issue. Um, and usually what happens, or sorry, actually it could be three things, or it could be a potassium issue. So what I'll usually do is I'll kind of troubleshoot with my clients and I'll find out, I'll ask questions. I'll say, well, how much water are you drinking? And then, you know, someone says, well, I'm only drinking, you know, coffee and maybe a cup of water a day. We, well, we all know coffee is a diuretic, so that's not good. So if they're only drinking one or two cups of water a day, that's not enough. So then I'll get them drinking more water throughout the day. And you, for the average person, I'll usually start them on at least two liters of water a day. If that doesn't work, then I'll move on to um, electrolytes. Oh, I'll, I'll say, okay, let's add some electrolytes to your water. Now, I don't mean electrolytes as in Gatorade or Powerade. I mean just pure electrolytes. So you can get those at London Drug, Shopper Drug Marks in the pharmacy section, and there's no calories in them. It's just, they're just crystals you add to your water. There's no taste. And that will usually solve the problem. Now, if that doesn't solve the problem, because I've had a few cases where the electrolytes did not work, then I'll get my clients to uh, supplement with potassium. And uh, sometimes I'll say, okay, you know what, we're going to add in a banana before you work out just to see. So, and you know, sometimes that actually does work. I had one client where he swears by the banana as his pre-workout now and it works, no cramping, the cramping is gone. So whether that's the potassium or placebo, it's, it's working for him. Um, I usually will recommend that someone supplement with potassium. 
if that's an issue, if it's constant cramping, especially on leg day. That's quite common for quite a few people. But usually it's either a dehydration issue. And if the water is not working, then what I'll do is I'll get them to add electrolytes to the water. So I'd recommend if you're, if you're drinking enough water, let's say you are drinking your two liters of water a day, add some electrolytes in first and see how that works. And if it doesn't work, then start thinking about supplementing with potassium or taking like a banana a day and just seeing if that helps, banana pre-workout. That should usually get rid of the cramping though. Okay, uh, last question. How common is recreational drug use in the fitness industry? I have a friend who used to be a personal trainer and tells me that most people that work in the fitness industry like to party pretty hard. <laughs> Sorry, there's a dog outside barking. Uh, <laughs> uh, this, is a, this is a funny question because you would think working in the fitness industry that everyone is super uber healthy and fit and everyone, you know, the, 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 you look at the bodies and the physiques and everyone's in great shape, especially personal trainers or fitness models. And, but that's really not the case. I have to be honest. I remember when I first started working in this industry, I used to run a boot camp with my business, my ex-business partner at the time. And uh, I didn't know this until a few years later after but he was someone who liked to party really hard and we would run a boot camp together and what i found out is years later he had he had all this energy when we were doing these boot camp classes together we'd be training oh, man this guy's got so much energy he must be on so much caffeine and we were training these boot camps at six in the morning years later what i found out is that he was doing uh, two rails of cocaine before we started the actual boot camp class and that would usually last him through the morning until about maybe 10 or 11 in the morning and he would, I guess he would do it again because he'd had even more energy for the lunch hour class. So what I found out over time from hanging out with people in the, in the fitness industry is that most of them don't drink alcohol because of the calories, but they like to do other things, you know, cocaine, ecstasy. And I'm not saying all of them, but I'm, I'm saying a lot of them do. And that's very common in the bodybuilding industry too. I know a lot of bodybuilders like to party pretty hard with those drugs. So your friend isn't wrong. I wouldn't say that's every trainer though. I mean, that. I don't use those drugs, but I know I point, I know quite a few people who are ex personal trainers, and I'm not going to name names, and they know who they are. But yes, that that's pretty common in the fitness industry that a lot of people like to use recreational drugs. Uh, let's face it; I mean, when you're a trainer or if you're a fitness model, your body is your marketing tool. You you can't be out drinking and eat beer all night because that's going to get you a beer belly, and you can't be out eating bad food. And so, what do you do? I mean. There's alternatives to that. And that's what people usually do in our industry. And it's, it's actually quite common. So to answer that question, I say, yes, I know quite a few people from back in the day, especially when I used to train people in my twenties and a lot of the trainers I worked with then they were, they party hard. Uh, I don't think they party hard anymore. You know, they're in their late thirties, early forties. Now they've got kids and they've toned it down a bit, but that was quite common back in the day. And I'm, I'm sure it is still today. I mean, I don't know the younger trainers, what they're doing, but when I was coming up, a lot of trainers were doing some pretty crazy drugs. Uh, and it's, it's not funny. I shouldn't be laughing. I'm just, I'm thinking about this now. And it's, it's a funny question because you would think in this industry, people would be more healthy, right? But that's far from the truth. It's, uh, <laughs> it, let's put it this way. If, if you're in the gym and you see a trainer who's got so much energy and he's cranked up and he's running around and. I don't know if it's just caffeine or, or he or she is just extra happy to be there. But yeah, I, I do think for the most part, a lot of the trainers back in the day anyways, and a lot of bodybuilders and a lot of fitness competitors were using recreational drugs. Maybe that's changed now. I mean, I, I'm old, so I don't know. Maybe that's, that's something the thing of the past, but I, I wouldn't say your friend is wrong. No. Uh, guys, thank you so much for tuning into this week's Q and a, uh, this episode should go up on Friday January 20th, 28th. Yeah, January 28th. And yeah, so I'll try to get the next weekly Q&A up next week. And if you have any questions, please feel free to either email them to me at nick at foreverfitperformance.com or you can DM them to me on Instagram at fitcosgrove underscore. And I'm always happy to answer any questions. I'll answer them on the channel. Like I said, we have a few more questions to get through. I'm going to make a second part episode for this series. And yeah, so I really appreciate everyone's support. Uh, I'm going to try to continue to do this best I can, even though restrictions are lifted. And even though we have our online training, training platform Q&A as well, I'm still going to try to continue to do this on the YouTube channel because I've had a few people express interest in watching these videos. 
So yeah, if we can gain a bigger following, I'll, I'll keep putting the videos up. I mean, they're fun to do and I love answering questions. And like I said, these are just my opinions. Take it for what it is, whether you agree, disagree, it's up to you. But just on my 20 plus years of working in this industry, th this is just my opinion. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching and everyone have a great weekend. See you later. Bye.